the, the presentation. I'd like to welcome you to our Restaurant Resilience Series. Uh, we started this a few months ago to help our restaurant clients and, and business partners in the community uh, navigate through some of the unique stuff that the people in our industry get to deal with, um, which is different than some others. Uh, today, we're gonna be looking into our digital marketing for the restaurant industry. Some of the things we're gonna talk about today is the website user experience. Are you socially shareable? Organic versus paid outreach. Google My Business and citation listings, vetting and auditing your current marketing vendors, and seeing what's new and old marketing technologies are coming on in 2021. My name is Anna Minear. I'm a CARES business analyst here at the Maricopa SBDC. I focus on our restaurant hospitality and tourism clients. Before I start, I would like to give you a brief overview of the services and resources available through the SBDC. The Maricopa SBDC is part of a national and state network of small business centers. Our main offering is no fee counseling. Here in Maricopa County, we have approximately 17 counselors and I'm sorry, they're spread across the county for easy access to our clients. We're all working virtually at this time, but hope that will change soon. At the end of the session today, we'll discuss how you can request the no fee counseling. We offer no or low cost programs for such as our topic today, um, which is really valuable to our members, clients and non-clients can join too. This will also be posted online. We're available to provide these services because we're funded by the federal level of the Small Business Administration and here locally by Maricopa County Community Colleges partnering with the Arizona Commerce Authority. Briefly, our technical assistance covers a variety of topic areas with the sampling shown here. During this challenging time, we continue to assist our clients as they navigate the COVID relief funding programs. We also help our clients to identify and access lenders, offer financial reviews, marketing assessments, and planning. As I mentioned, we have counselors who are experts in a variety of areas, including manufacturing, technology, commercialization, export, and international trade. Through the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, PTAC, we also help clients access government contracting support. So I'm sure you're curious about the Restaurant Revitalization Fund uh, that we know just came through legislation, uh, also known as the RRF. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot to update on just yet, but this is what we do know. Um, and again, of course, subject to change until their final rules do come out. Uh, we did find out that you no longer need to get a SAM.gov registration, which is fantastic. and will save our restaurants a lot of time. All food service uh, establishments are eligible as long as you don't have more than 20 locations. Businesses that opened in 2019, you'll take the average of your 2019 monthly gross revenue, multiply that by 12, then take the average of your 2020 monthly gross revenue, multiply that by 12, subtract the 2020 amount from the 2019 amount, and then any PPP loans you received. And that is PPP loans in 2020 or 2021. For businesses that opened in 2020 or 2021, prior to March 11th, you're eligible to receive funding equal to the eligible expenses incurred in 2020 minus gross revenue and any PPP funding you received. There's a link here uh, to the Restaurant Act website, which is they're keeping updated. There's some FAQ sheets there. Again, we don't know when applications are going to open and exactly what it looks like, but this will give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, if you request counseling from our center, your counselor will be able to keep you up to date on any of changing rules or regulations to this program. I'd like to introduce today, Chris Bill. He's a coworker of mine, business analyst with the CARES team specializing in digital marketing. And I'm gonna go ahead and let Chris take it from here. Thanks, Anna. All right. All right. As I get situated here, um, let me get over here. All right. Uh, good to go? Good to go. Okay, perfect. Um, well, um, obviously, she already went through all these things and my computer went back. I'm Chris Phil, and I am the SDDC. Uh, business analyst for Maricopa County uh, in the realm of digital marketing. Um, I come with 18 plus years of entrepreneurial experience, 10 of those being digital marketing enthusiasts. Um, and I am just so happy to be here during these times to assist our small businesses. Uh, 
uh, well, we've kind of went through this one already here. Um, let's see here. So we're going to go to the digital marketing ecosystem, what I like to call it. And it's kind of weird, right? It's like, where do we all start? So uh, it's always a big question. I consider uh, uh, online marketing to be an ecosystem, a system of interconnecting and interacting parts, uh, you know, formed by some distinct areas of content creation, uh, search engine optimization, um, you know, and social media and target marketing. So uh, sustainable success in digital marketing is achieved usually with strategies that leverage interrelationship of these ecosystems and elements and are Ideally, they're implemented by cohesive teams, either all working for your establishment or maybe as an agency who understand digital marketing online. And, uh, you know, it's not just posts and paperless kites that we now know as emails, uh, but more that of a unique digital handshake or a pass of a baton. I like to use the analogy to the next vehicle to carry the message. Uh, now, the specific strategies uh, and individual tools included in, in the marketing ecosystem and used to execute digital marketing campaigns are dependent really on many factors, including goals uh, for the campaign, as well as maybe the company and industry and the customer's buying habits, right? And where there are literally thousands of tools available, I prefer to speak to those that are you know, proven to be effective in their respective functions today. So with all, here we go. Um, let's see what we got going next. So website user experience, my top eight, uh, one would be to capture the viewer's attention. It's super important to, you know, obviously in our own relationships, make a good first impression. Well, the first impression to your customer is your site in this digital world that we live in as we're sourcing through our phones or PCs, right? So uh, the look and feel of your website and, uh, uh, you know, is what you get is the first chance. Therefore, ensure that they're you know, design is closely aligned to your brand, your marketing strategy, your target audience. And I hope you've all done that research this part uh, and appropriate for, uh, you know, to be attractive and have a professional design to engage with your viewers and, and to be able to consume such content. Now, uh, improve website load time is a very important thing. How many times you've been on a site and it's just taking forever to load? Maybe it's the outdated machine you're on, but maybe it's also that, you know, uh, your web developer or maybe yourself uploaded some photos that are a little too big or you maybe got some code in the back end that's not correlating correctly with the speed that it needs to be at. Load time is one of the uh, top contributors to people bouncing from your site because it has a hard time to load. Maybe it loads great on your iPhone, uh, but you got to be thinking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, so and so over here that maybe uh, having the still the BlackBerry uh, that's not supported any longer, right? So load time is critical, and Google offers some free tools on this area. Uh, I'll I'll be sure when I'm done with the presentation, add some links uh, in, into the chat so that way you can go ahead and and kind of you know audit yourself or audit maybe the person uh, individual that's kind of helping you with those, uh, that marketing. So three, avoid knowing pop-ups, right? There's so many ways to get the newsletter and the discount codes and everybody wants to go put it out there and they think it's this way of a pop-up, but there's no better way also just to scare them away, uh, especially again, like they're using the old technology and it just freezes or nowadays even like Zoom, you know, we freeze and uh, uh, you know, the pop-ups in, in, in those areas of realms of plugins of your site, you know, typically tend to do those things. So, uh, you know, going on to the next I have is interactive content, right? Maybe you have a live Instagram feed. Maybe uh, you're, you're a restaurateur and you're, you want to showcase your chef in the back, you know, bringing in a new plate or an ingredient. Nothing better than to go interactive on the site and go live. And maybe it's a pre-recording. Maybe it's what's going on today. Uh, streaming channel. Maybe it's a Q&A search bar that people can ask questions. And maybe you don't have all the answers right away because maybe you're sourcing those questions and yet you are now crowd building a Q&A profile so that later on when others come visit, it automatically delivers them the answers to those questions. So interactive uh, you know, web development is becoming more and more of the thing today. Uh, embedding the right social media buttons. You know, it's great that you're on every social media channel out there because everybody says you need to be on this, you need to be on that, and you know, now this is out and we need to go after that. And that's great. And I can tell you many reasons why you want to be on 
every single social media channel, but you only need to advertise on your site the ones that you are staying active on, keeping up to date on, you know, uh, distributing your message of events or discounts or, or, or maybe a fundraisers or whatever it is that your business is involved in the community because social is social is community, right? And community is sharing and caring and understanding what it is that you're doing, but nobody cares about, you know, your, your next Tumblr uh, uh, thing, unless Tumblr is maybe to your business model. I don't know, but there's so many out there and they work in great correlation with each other for rankings, but for relevancy, as far as you and I, as a user coming to source of subject, stick to the ones that, you you know stay active on uh next six i have using images to break up your text obviously uh it's an image world you know it's a video world the more we have of content creation when it comes to imagery and and, and video and other things where we can watch rather than read uh, you know images are going to be you know can not only help your appeal of insight flow but they can also have big impacts on rank factors while people are searching for your product or establishment or service. Uh, there's more to come actually on a round table, digital round table that I host in this month. It's on the 28th. Come out and check it out because I'll be covering a lot of stuff on image and video marketing and how that will help your ranking. Uh, and seven I have is design and menu. Uh, you know, I think one of the most reasons and uh, again, you know, uh, in and out burger might be the most successful is uh, in the burger realm is, you know, they have a simple menu. Well, when it comes to web development, design and menu and simply said, keep it friendly and relevant. Remember, you know your business more than anyone. Customers come to source of subject matter, help them find it by staying broad in the menu, but yet specific on the pages that you create. Um, and as well as utilizing internal links, right? Those little words that are blue over the other ones that are black, that's what they call link siloing, okay? To assist in navigating searchers, acting as mile markers while traveling through your site. And if you do that correctly and you get them from the top to the bottom, Google likes that. And then they like to serve you, the next person, on the next time that there is a search query in regards to your product or service. Um, eight is my last one is responsive design. Uh, responsive design, this has been around for uh, quite a while now. There used to be a part where you had to build an individual site and then you had to build a mobile phone site. And now it's what they call responsive design. So when you're developing a website and, or, or your webmaster is developing it for you, we need to make sure that uh, it's relaying the creative and the content with the same appeal and flow from desktop application to mobile phone or even a tablet. Your web developer or you, like I said, doing the, it needs to make sure it's optimized for the both. And there's nothing worse than to, I think my bank just barely transferred over this, but it has the desktop site that you still kind of got to, you know, zoom in on it and then it just doesn't function right. And it's then, again, that's what's happening. we got a high bounce rate. People are leaving the site. I might be spending money on ads or I'm doing other things or even spending my own time trying to push people to the site to come and see what we're doing, but yet they're leaving and now those dollars are being wasted. So make sure that your site is being built responsive um, and test that out through your mobile phone to your PC. You can audit your web developer yourself very easily on those things. Okay, next, are you socially shareable? <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you what, shareable content is entertainment, right? The people react to. Your pieces should, uh, you know, ultimately have high interest, response, preferably a positive one, right, should be the key. Also, uh, you know, shareable content leads to social validation, right? Instagram, you know, what do we look, how do we do, what's it look like, what's the filter we're using? Uh, we all have a need for people to approve of our actions opinions. It's called ego, right? So this means many people will follow the flow. They will upvote comments, like on internet places like Reddit or, 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 or Quora. Uh, that have been already liked by other people. Positive energy and attitude. Sharing is caring. Like I said just a slide ago, uh, always wins. Uh, also to consider is visual appeal, right? The, the TikTok of uh, the eras are going now and everybody's setting out these Insta reels and it's funny and it's great, but quality matters a lot, right? Especially when it comes to your business. And even you as an individual and trying to maybe become a business as an influencer or a coach, right? And what you post and how you post it is, 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 is so relevant, so, but so does appearance. So even content has to look nice for people to read and share it, right? So be sure to 
organize your pieces in an easily scannable way that doesn't confuse readers, avoid huge, you know, areas of text. There's that, you know, there's always that person that posts and, and tries to distribute content, but the, 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 you know, it's a paragraph long before we actually get to the creative, which we're supposed to consume, which that will move us emotionally. So, you know, it's also important, uh, you know, with those, the colors and visual elements, you know, I'm big on psychological colors and how they influence people. And you should be using those in a harmonious way when you are doing your creative or your web developers doing your creative or your, or, or your individual that's creating your, your imagery that's being distributed through your, either your email processes or your, you know, here we're talking about social posts, which now a lot of them interact these days. So uh, they won't distract the readers from the text. So each piece should work well, fit like that of a puzzle. And, uh, you know, um, consider your content also speaks to, you know, the following. Understand people like LinkedIn is use social media for many reasons, but one of the main is to connect with other people, right? Who do similar, have similar interests or do similar things as theirs. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the takeaway here is stay practical in your message. If you observe articles that get tons of attention on social media, you will notice that you're not only, in, they're not only interesting and fun, but they are also very informative, right? And you say, how do they do that? Well, they solve problems. Either it be to make you laugh, which is probably the most common, right? We're laughing all the time, especially with the new TikTok uh, developments going on. Um, um, but, you know, uh, uh, or maybe it's what's to eat tonight, right? Uh, scan such images of food. We're tasting through our phones or our PCs. So how do they look? What do they look like, right? And the creative. Uh, I love how an AC company out here, there's an AC company out here that I follow. I got think the guy's a brilliant marketer. Um, and, uh, you know, they say every time they have a unit and they're servicing it, they, if they miss a note, if they, if they miss, if they notice that there's a screw missing in the unit, they'll replace it with a bright red one of their own. Now that's the, that the other guy maybe forgot to put back, Sh showcase the piece of information and build content around it and watch the mind work. That's great marketing. Okay. Organic versus paid outreach. This has always been a, a pretty large question that people have uh, is, you know, or what I like to call earned, right? So you got, uh, I do not remember the exact company, another company that I remember, I've lived in the Valley all my life, uh, back in the day here that said, uh, I had a marketing message that stated, we do not just ask for your business, we earn it. Or maybe it was, we do business the old fashioned way, we earn it. But to me, it was a result of what your customers share of you on your reviews, your posts, or maybe it's a media coverage from a fundraiser you were part of, or, or a kind gesture as a business you provided to the community, like offered your services to someone in need that cannot afford them, but you felt the need to engage and give back. But also it's the ability to provide relevant content, right? You hear that a lot to individuals seeking such with an industry you serve. Maybe this comes in the form of consistent blog posting or maybe your team and you created a podcast and you're looking to launch a YouTube channel and your team, you know, manage it. And you, you need to keep it up to date, right? Having your citation directories, listings and profiles fully filled out and updated like your Google My Business and Yelp and Bing and Apple Maps and geez, and there's so many more and many others, but uh, which we'll get into more in the next couple of slides. Uh, you know, the next is uh, pay or the show me your money platform, right? I say uh, this is where ad copy or ad imagery, kind of like what we were talking about, the creative, the creative video, the creative uh, the imagery, uh, pictures, and, and how we give and perceive those to others uh, being spun up and deployed over ad platforms. And you as the business owners promoting or getting charged the multiple directions of choice. Uh, one being you hear these acronyms a lot. PPC, which stands for pay per click, or CPI, which is cost per impression, which means you are charged a certain market rate of every thousand people that see such ad. Then there's many others, such as engagement and conversions, and so on and so on and so on. There's they have new ones coming out all the time of how they can microcharge you in the digital market, uh, a, a segment in marketing, but both provide reporting metrics like analytics and set up correctly with whichever platform you are using to deploy such tactics. One that I'm a super fan of is the, you have the owned ones, right? The websites, unless you're using, 
I'm not trying to downplay certain PIA, you know, site platforms out there, but you know, unless you're using a subscription sites like Shopify or Etsy or BitCartel or, you know, or these other sites that cost you, you know, 30, 40 bucks a month, if not more to keep your site live. You know, if you do use those sites, please understand and know how to download your data files so that if you do run into an area where maybe you cannot make that payment that month or you just aren't spending time on the site because you're so busy offline that when you're ready to come back to it, you're not recreating all this content and all this imagery that just took you so much time to build because that's kind of the game. They understand that and that does what? Keeps you using their product longer. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, make sure ongoing blogging in which you you may turn a series into an ebook or for future ongoing distribution and sharing. Uh, emails and sorts of formats are triggering to stay engaged with your customers in the forms of maybe surveys or follow-ups, uh, community events uh, and schedules with your company uh, with header on it, and downloadable areas. There's so many things, but they're your digital assets. So like the Venn graph shows above, having an optimal mix for sure will leverage them all and then increase, wash, rinse, repeat. It's the same thing. It's a rotation of such. Okay. One of my, uh, uh, you know, I think Google My Business is one of my favorite as far as a Google product. Uh, what is it? Obviously, it's a, it's a listing online that uh, it is absolutely free to you. Uh, who should use it? You know, I'd say, you know, any business with a physical location should create a profile or regularly update the information, regularly update the information in the listing. So many people don't do that. You know, it's free. When something's free, you know, the, but when, you know, your parents are purchasing something, it's kind of, but this is a very important tool. So make sure you keep it up to date. Also understand how to use the many, many tools what's inside the Google My Business application that can drive traffic to the business, but can also drive traffic away from the business, such as reviews and stuff like that if you're not responding to them. Uh, why is it important? Well, to get customers, so, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're here to do is we set out in the entrepreneurial journey to get customers and Google's in the in the business of delivering you as a business to these customers if you provide the correct information. So showcase your business offering, provide up-to-date contact information, gather reviews, and many, many more reasons. So best of all, I mean, it's free for now. <laughs> uh, Google, I've been reading a lot, and Google's looking to possibly monetize this. And uh, for right now, it, it doesn't cost anything, and it's huge as far as a tool uh, not only in the, uh, the free search, but SEO and how it can link to other things. And there's more to that to come. So a uh, couple of examples I have of, of, of some businesses I have, you know, one is a, I have over here is a low quality uh, listing that I have an example. This listing you'll notice lacks some key elements to it. One, it's missing the business hours of operation. Uh, there's no phone number, there's no website. Uh, it has low reviews or no response when I opened it up. I had no response to any of the reviews. I think it's sitting at a 3.8. And uh, uh, there's, so to me, there's no reputation management going on. Maybe nobody's responding, but no, nobody's paying attention. Maybe they don't even know that they have those reviews. Maybe they don't even look online to see where they're sitting at. Uh, uh, but also there's zero feedback in the ways of Q&A. The company has no really where else to guide the searcher off page, like a website to source other information, to build the trust on the business besides the listing itself. Um, such social links to stay in tune to deals or even events. So now over here on the right, Curry in a hurry, I love the name, um, you know, obviously has many reviews. Um, you know, looks like they're doing great reputation management, good or bad, you know. Uh, you know, they earn the trust offline. They have a website to go to. Uh, when I asked my Alexa, which I had to be quiet, she might go off, uh, who has curry near me at 11 a.m., uh, curry in a hurry is probably most likely going to be the one, if it's near me, to get served to me, because that's where we're going. Voice instant search, okay? Voice instant search. 
soon, you know, now before it was seven listings in Google, my business, when you search the product or service or restaurant or whatever, then it became three. Now, if you look, when you do a search, well, now you ask Alexa, she's not giving you three options. She's giving you one. And it's all dependent upon how your citations are filled out. And, and if you're missing hours and sites and maybe some Q&A questions, because we're asking stuff on our phone all the time, you might miss the opportunity on that voice search, which actually just gives it and says, call Curry in a hurry. Uh, to me, is important. Gyms, dry cleaners, and on and on and on. Anybody with a brick and mortar, Billy's out correctly. Use the tools inside. Keep them up to date, and you're going to have a better result uh, of such. All right. What attracted Google My Business? Well, first one is insight reports. This will all tell us people are finding us, uh, how people are finding us, where we're being viewed the most, uh, what keywords our customers are using while searching. It tells you in there. Go in there, it'll tell you your top keywords that people are plugging in that you are being, that you are, 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 are coming up as the search result. There might be a keyword that you didn't even know that people are using that is actually delivering you as the provider of such keywords. Well, take that information, let's build content around it, let's distribute the content, and let's move more of that traffic to it. Uh, a lot said, but that's 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 the search game. Uh, the next would be reviews, right? Remember to always respond to both positive and negative reviews with a professional attitude. You know, there's times where they, people leave those bad reviews. Maybe it was totally rubbing. Maybe it's a competitor. I don't know. Whoever it is. But you know what? You got to stay the same guideline. Let's stay positive. Let's be enticing. Let's, let's provide service uh, and, 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 and gratitude. Either it be bad or, or, or good. You know, I appreciate the feedback. We will look into the service. Uh, you know, thank you so much for coming in. Please come back again. Keep them short. Keep them simple. But give the feedback. And remember, that others after are reading and watching, right? How many people have you, me, I'm big. I go in, I look at reviews and I'm like, okay, because I understand, you know, there might be some written by employees or whatever, but now if I read the comments, you kind of see an algorithm, a conversation. Um, and, and to me, that's important. Uh, messaging, uh, it's a new feature with inside the Google My Business platform. It came out about, uh, let's say about two years ago, a year and a half, it was in beta for a while. But more and more people are finding it convenient to message through Google My Business, right? Uh, you have to have the app downloaded on your phone um, in order to, to uh, respond to, or to get the push notification. There's other ways on your desktop. You want to pay attention to your email all day, but uh, the phone tells you right then when somebody's messaging you and they want to have a question. So, uh, But if you have that uh, part enabled, Within the Google My Business, you've got to make sure that you're paying attention and you're responding back. You can't say, oh, I'll respond back to them later. It's, it's an instant world. We want instant response. We want it, right? So that's what people are expecting. And Google will shut that off after 24 hours. The whole messaging part of your platform, if they see you have a lack in response time. So if you're not going to use it, make sure it's off. That way people know to click to call. It's not showing message because remember, Google's in the business of serving you, let's say, as the consumer relevant information. And if you want to message somebody, they're going to give you somebody that you can message. And if you have that on and you're not responding back, well, there you go. Bounce right again. Uh, relevant. You got to stay relevant. All right. So citations. To me, I this is my, I'm the biggest fan of this it, 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 on the online web it, it, for for actual search engine optimization, it's one of the most easiest things to do. It's a little bit, it takes a little bit of time, but if you hire out, you know, for pretty inexpensive, you can, you can get it going real good. But the number one big question always is, Chris, why do local citations matter? Well, local citations significantly influence two scenarios relating to local businesses, okay? Local citations either positively or negatively impact local search engine rankings. The number of citations a business accrues is the accuracy of the data they feature, right? And the quality of the platform they exist on uh, all influence rankings, right? So Google My Business, you have, we have Yelp here, we have Twitter, we have MapQuest, which I don't even know if people use MapQuest anymore, but I'll tell you what, they're a really good person to be uh, involved with still because they like to pass, you know, uh, a citation, I call it link juice to, to, to searchers. Uh, uh, Google Maps' data about each of these businesses, right? So 
if what they encounter is accurate, the search engine trusts the validity that I, the, like I was saying, uh, of the data, which is believed to strengthen the business and the chance of ranking well. So it gives the end user the, the uh, search result uh, being hopefully your business. However, if the data search engine encounter an inconsistency, maybe you had an old phone number and then you have a citation over here on another, let's say Angie's list, it's a new phone number, or maybe you're a business with many phone numbers and somebody that was setting up Angie's list, they decided to use a different number. We need to stay consistent with all those numbers. If you have a location in Tempe and you have a Tempe phone number, then that phone number needs to correlate with the Angie's list Tempe citation and the Manta citation. Everything needs to be duplicated as the same across all of these different search directories of listings. Okay, uh, this trust is, if not, the trust is eroded, uh, lessening ranking opportunities. Now, local citations either could, uh, 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 you know, they, there's also, you know, uh, a few different kind of local citations as far as, you know, what kind uh, of, of, of citations make up different areas of search and how they help you, right? So there are a few types of local citations, major local business data platforms, let's say like, uh, like your uh, Google My Business, I don't know if you've heard of Axiom, but Axiom is a data aggregator, which that you can, you can basically take a spreadsheet of if you're a business with multiple locations, you can create a, a Excel sheet and you can upload that to Axiom's website. And in Axiom, what they do is they distribute it along uh, uh, all the other people out there as far as search directories. So that enables everybody to kind of stay accurate uh, and all those other things. Now, we also have geo industry specific platforms. Um, and that's, uh, you know, in addition to building local business listings, like what we talked about before, it, on local business data platforms, um, your company can seek to build listings on websites that are specific to its unique industry, geography. Maybe uh, examples of some of those platforms would be like your chamber of commerce. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I had a lady that we were counseling uh, here recently, and she's like, "Yeah, you know what? I'm part of you know Chandler Chamber." And I'm like, "Oh, that's great. You know, let, let me see how it's going. Let me see the site. I looked at the site. I seen the Chandler Chamber link." I'm like, oh, that's great. You have the Chandler Chamber link. I clicked on the Chandler Chamber link. It just brought me to the Chandler Chamber homepage. I said, hold on, we need to take that and we need to change that to go from instead of the Chandler Chamber homepage, we need to change it to go to the Chandler Chamber homepage slash your profile. And then let's link it back. And I think within just that little bit uh, in a week, she's seen search results go up, you know, 20, 30%. So that was good. But there's, so there's certain ways to do it. And, and, uh, uh, websites like that and professional associations and guilds you got to make sure when you're doing that and you're and you're advertising that's where you know a part of this organization that you're linking back to the profile not just the actual site that helps you get the rankings that you need the wider web uh, supplementary uh, citations can either be built or earned on a wide variety of publications including blogs and guest blogging and news sites if you're doing pr releases and stuff like that uh, there's a great company that I find a ton of value in. It's a company called Haro. That's H-A-R-O, Haro.com. It stands for Help a Reporter Out. And these are reporters that are always seeking and sourcing for information of news. Maybe they're writing a, a blog on, uh, you know, or an article on a you know, pool equipment or maybe a, a, a fine Italian dish that, uh, you know, people are, they, they found to be popular, right? Well, these guys they, or, and girls, they'll pick up that information and they will write, write about it and they'll link back to you and then they'll distribute such content. And that creates what they call backlinks to you. So super important. Uh, and, and there's a ton of it out there. Uh, the most common components over to the left that I just popped up uh, for a local citation as you uh, or someone decides to build them out for a business include uh, the following business categories, your hours of operations, which we discussed because we're going into voice. We're going into voice. We're going into voice. We're going into voice. Not telling you we're going to voice. We already know. So make sure your hours of operations are there, your driving directions if you need people to go. How do I get to, right? We're speaking images and videos, payment forms accepted, and so on and so on and so on. And we'll make the deck available to you uh, as we conclude the, this session. Okay. The next thing that is so very important to me is vetting your digital marketing agency, right? So many of them out there, and we have so many questions. Well, 
to me, deciding what digital marketing model is right for your business can be an incredibly difficult time decision. It's important to remember that there's no one size that fits all solution. There's not. There's different. There's people that specialize in certain areas of digital marketing, and then there's some that they'll take anybody, right? So what may be the right one for your buddy's Arizona tumbleweed shipping business may not be the right one for your frog breeding company. Seriously, though, those are those are real businesses. So I swear. But if you decided that digital marketing HC is the way to go, it's important to do your due diligence and properly vet various agencies. And be aware, you always got the snake oil sales guy out there. He's been around since he's been trying to put foot, shoes on your feet at Foot Locker to selling you a new used car. But now they're selling digital aid, digital marketing companies are, uh, are everywhere on the on the corners. Well, so we'll go there. <laughs> uh, but my big six questions to ask your digital marketing company before hiring is kind of the, you know the guy sitting in the middle here. The questions that he's asking: What's your process like? Okay, an open-ended question like this is a great way to start. Well, they might have prepared an answer in place, which is fine. This will give you a good idea of how flexible they are with engagement. Certain processes put in place are expected, uh, like bi-weekly reporting and calls and analytics. And, you know, that's super important, which I love taking those calls. Schedule with me. I love to look at an analytics report for you and see what we can kind of see what's going on um, if you're struggling in there. But if your engagements are so processed out, uh, there also leaves no wiggle room. So it can be difficult for them to work with your unique needs. But again, there's no one right solution for anybody. The rigid agency process can be ideal for some companies, but just know that, uh, their size of process will work best. You know, which type of process will work best for you is, is what you got to ultimately think about uh, for the best for you. So two, what kind of guarantees can you give me? You know, if an agency offers you guarantees, like we'll get you to the first page of Google for all your top keywords within one month. I mean, I know you and I, everybody gets those calls, uh, the, the, the robo calls and uh, you're Google my business location and da, 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 da. We'll get, listen, you know what? Uh, if you're going to get to me in the first two of Google top keywords within a month or well, uh, you know, conversions in a week or, you know, whatever top, you know, I'm going to get you all these things. It's time to run. Uh, it's a huge red flag. This stuff takes time. You know, when it, you know, it, SEO, you're looking, you know, by the first month that you invest to the six months that you've been engaged is before you're going to really start to see search results uh, cranking for you if somebody's doing it correctly. Paid search, it takes time to meet certain guidelines and goals within the search algorithm and keywords that you chose and build out your campaign before it goes from costing you $8 a click. And I'm just using that as a number, so don't think that's what it costs, to $2 a click, right? Or even on some social, geez, I've seen down to a nickel a click and people are just boosting out the roof. So it's how it's all created and what, what what's going on. So, uh you know, so you got to be careful with that. Instead, an agency should speak towards past client successes, their short-term versus long-term strategies, and how they'll work with you to help meet your goals. Uh, do you outsource? You know, it's an outsourcing world. A lot of people outsource, which is not it's particularly bad, but uh, you're not necessarily looking for a yes or no here. While it's great if agencies keep everything in-house, there are plenty of that outsource and do it well. Okay, it's just who understands, you know, how to project manage correctly. And what is that process? Maybe what technology do you use, right? To, to, to manage all this. What's, what's telling here is how they describe their relationship with their employees or partners. If they maintain consistent, you know, constant and open communication with outsourcers, this can be an adequate solution. Uh, do you charge an hourly or by retainer? You know, some people charge a retainer. Hey, thousand dollars a month, you get X, Y, Z, or hey, you know what? You get charge by the hour. Again, this is a question that doesn't require a yes or no answer. It's more about what their pricing model means for your engagement, right? So if they charge a minimum retainer that only includes a set amount of hours, well, it's possibly that they may not go above and beyond to help you during busy months. Uh, so make sure that you understand how the engagement would be structured and how they handle it in any immediate or emergency needs from their clients. I had a client recently that was doing an Amazon deal and within there, uh, they, it was a pay per performance model. But once they reached a certain threshold, I think it was 80% of these certain sales, then the, then the retainer would shift to more of a pay per percentage model. Totally client didn't see it. We looked at it, we brought it up. And now we're, we're in a better situation because it's explained. Uh, who owns the accounts? If you ever wanted to leave this digital marketing agency, 
do they do you have to restart your paid campaign over again do you need to when you go in and you want to change some citations listings because you have a new phone number like i told you it was so critical that we keep everything consistent and they own those and now they want to charge you to enter into your own citation and you can't afford it or maybe you have something that's not in your budget and you can't change. well now see how that's affecting your ranking you need to own your accounts. You need to own your assets, 100%. Many HC contractually own your cookie pools, right? Your re It's what they call retargeting. So like uh, the data that you gather from a piece of content that you push out there through what they call pixels, um, uh, you, then you retarget them later. It's like you, you, how many times have you searching for a vacuum online or, or you're reading about something and you go to something else and next thing Kirby's over here, right? I mean, that's retargeting. Those are cookie pools. So you need to own those. Uh, your AdWords account, like we talked about, uh, this is done to keep you from leaving the agency. Plain and simple. It's 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 just a way to corral you in, uh, uh, and it's super unethical. So next, uh, what is your company culture like? Me, I'm big on that. I personally like the question. It's a way to give the person on the other end of the phone an opportunity to really speak towards their company, right? I want to see the passion. You know, can you tell me someone's feeding you a line about their culture versus really enjoying working there? Trust me, we know you can, right? You know, if you're excited about your company, you're excited to tell me when I get on counseling sessions, I'm so excited to help the small business that I really feel like I have this energy that I push through. And, it, it, you know, it, 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 and you should feel the same, that when you're talking to them, you're vetting them, you know, a place that people truly enjoy doing into work every day or going into work every day is a place that's going to be enjoyable to work with, right? So, and, and they're going to be always looking out for your best interest. And this is marketing, man. This is fun. We need, we're out there making money and we're, we're trying to grow business and we're high five and we're doing these things. And if not, we're, we're tucked out in a huddle and figuring out how are we going to move the ball next? And those are the people we want to work with, right? So stick with these big six and you'll feel more comfortable on your decision and how you like to proceed forward, okay? The next thing here, new and old marketing technologies, and we're concluding right here with this slide uh, to go into a Q&A here a little bit after, uh, but the new things that are going to 2021, I'm gonna to try to make this short as possible because I'm just taking up a ton of time. Uh, as the pandemic kind of catapulted us into this new era of digital and new and old technologies came on stage and set show of how we are marketed to now and into the future. So to be honest, I did not see any letting up on the pedal. Data's king. This is what it is. I mean, it's being collected and we're we're being micro segmented and 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 they're delivering us what it is that we they feel is that we want to see to get us to buy purchase. All right. So let's go explore a little of what's going on and how they may fit maybe into your own business. Uh, the first one I have coming up is beacon and proximity Wi-Fi marketing. Lots said there, one mouth. Beacon, proximity Wi-Fi marketing. It's a marketing industry. It's not an uncommon one for these te this technology to emerge and it had actually quietly disappear for a few years. Beacons are one such technology that's had, it's taken some time away from the limelight in recent years. I don't know if anybody's really even heard of it. A lot of people I bring it up to, they're like, wow, I never know. And then I tell them, they're like, oh my God, I got to get a bunch of them. Uh, and there's small little devices that send out signals uh, over a short distance, uh, generally a, a few meters uh, in, in range and diameter. Uh, devices with this range are able to pick up the signal transmitted by the beacon, like your, like your cell phone. That's what they're designed to do or any other, you know, Bluetooth enabled device. Uh, and this allows you to target users at a close proximity with specific messages or actions. Uh, key benefits are, you know, include location targeting and mapping. Uh, frequency, in-store messaging. Have you ever been inside? Go to Nordstrom's. <laughs> and, and, and see if you have some apps running in the background. Next thing you know, they're delivering you a 5%, you know, come to the thing. I remember, uh, was that, you know, I forget, somewhere they got me to sign up for the loyalty program, but that's what they do. You know, gamification. Maybe they uh, launch a brand using uh, beacons to create a treasure hunt within the area while you're there to, to, to source, you know, something that's just fun and engaging for the consumer process. Cross-selling, targeting shoppers, loyalty programs, like I said, uh, and, you know, even, you know, announcing customer recalls if there is any. Uh, next brings us to QR codes and NFC wearables. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, QR codes were like a thing, right? We were like, what are these? You know, you know, whatever. I, shoot, I want to say like 10 years ago. I don't know. That's when I kind of remember they kind of came on the scene. 
and, but they were actually designed, yeah, in the in the early 90s, mid to late 90s, to take over the barcode. And the reason why is a QR code is actually nothing but a interface with a URL, like, you know, Google, www.google.com, embedded inside of it, which then can be dynamically changed to point somewhere else at any time, right? So if I scan the QR code at the restaurant and it brings me to the menu, but then tomorrow I say, ah, oh, I made a mistake in that menu, I can re-upload a different menu into a different URL, and then I can do what they call a 301 redirect to that old URL, and now the new content is live within a second. So it's dynamically shifted. Uh, and, 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 and it's now making a comeback. And I don't think they're going to use it for barcodes. Well, actually, they are using it for some barcode stuff. But more and more people are finding more creative ways to use these technologies. Now, NFC wearables stands for otherwise near-field communication. Usually any phone has it on there. You'll see the NFC enabled on your phone. It's an electronic method for smartphones and other devices to interact with each other with a close proximity. A net NFC works based on a tag or a small chip. They now make them even into rings, right? Where you can uh, shake a hand and next thing you know, boop, they get a notification on their phone. Kind of a cool way to pass a business card. I don't know, just a thought. Uh, so, you know, the NFC has a multiple different areas in addition to contactless payments and sending phone numbers and pictures, uh, sending documents, uh, you know, doing cool little things like I just told you about. Uh, but it, it has uh, multiple things to do. And it's, you know, technology being around. I mean, how many times do you, you know, beep yourself into your apartment complex? Or maybe if you work at a corporate office and beeping yourself into the, to the office with your card. NSC has been around doing that for now, for, for ages. But now people are using many, many ways to, to market it. So uh, as long as well, as well as QR codes are, a, you know, able to, uh, you know, enable Wi-Fi. If you've been in a hotel room and you're enabling your Wi-Fi, scanning the QR code, or you're using a browser, which helping you there. So uh, also sharing video and images and other things to collect feedback and ratings and maybe just even pass on a survey. So uh, uh, in short, micro-segmenting marketing, which I call it micro-segmented marketing, is here. And if planned accordingly as well as set up correctly, it could boost the bottom line very nicely and attract plenty of customers. No longer do we have to go so broad with what we're doing. Let's just take a mailer and mail it to this city. We can now segment that market and push notifications to our actual target customer and actually make an impact for, and make our dollars spread, uh, spread a little bit further. Okay. Uh, Key takeaways here in our discussion. Well, let's start with my favorite quote is the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low prices been forgotten. Uh, understand your digital landscape for your product or service. Okay. Give your customer a five-star experience from website to foot over the threshold and through the front door. Uh, share great content that's relevant to whom you are targeting so they may see and share the same value. Uh, Understand you need to give a little to get a little and quality counts and organic creative and the budget you set to compete with the ad marketplace. Don't just say you're going to spend 20 bucks and it's going to have a thing. Have a program, have a plan, have creative, put dollars into it, increase those budgets and then understand uh, it all works together. Always be branding. That's my model. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's a strategy, not just a statement. Build and earn citations everywhere you can and manage them correctly. Uh, never buy snake oil, you know, said. And last but not least, newer old innovations and how they are used for tactical digital marketing is up to the beholder. So think out of the box. Wear a ring, pass a business card, and just make it happen. Here we come to a slide where we have a Q&A. And if there's any in the Q&A box, which I'm not sure if there is, I don't see anything lighting up. And I'll pass it back over to Anna. Uh, and we'll go from there. But thanks for having me. All right, Chris, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So much information uh, to see there. It's, it's pretty amazing. All right, I have to my slides in order here. Sorry about that. A lot of information, huh? <laughs> a lot of information. 
That was fantastic. If anyone has questions, please go ahead. There's still time to put them in the Q&A. And uh, just to follow on with our SBDC information, to complete a request for counseling, you can go to our website, which is maricopa-sbdc.com. There's a simple form there. Uh, it doesn't take any time at all to fill out. Once that's submitted, you'll be partnered with your perfect counselor and uh, they'll be in touch to get you any information you need to help with your business. So once you complete that and get assigned a lead counselor, uh, they will be in touch, like I said. We also do have a pre-venture program uh, designed for new business ownership. So if you're just starting a business, we have a program completely for you uh, that can walk you through the entire process. We start with an initial counseling session, which you can see here. Uh, to get to know you and see exactly what you need from us. Uh, we continue on a time frame based on the client's needs or about every 60 day check in. If we don't hear from you, you'll be hearing from us. Counseling is by appointment only. We want to build long term relationships with our clients. It's really important that we can help you in the long term. Uh, we're here if you need a quick question too, but we really like those relationships that all the counselors really thrive on that. We guide, educate, and support our clients. We ask that our clients engage and do the work uh, that we ask to help you grow in your business. All right. Here are some of the tools we use. Um, we have lots of things available to you that you can uh, We have Growth Wheel, which is a business development tool. And Live Plan is if you're going to be doing a business plan. It's an online platform, great tool to take uh, from parts of the marketing plan here. Uh, that Chris kind of talked about. Our Profit Sense is a financial benchmarking data platform. And then we have market intelligence capabilities through SBDC Net and IBIS World that offers you comprehensive business industry reports. And you access these tools right through your SBDC, SBDC counselor. We have a few events coming up, uh, always, but here's some in the near future. Tomorrow we have How to Leverage America's Seed Fund. The next one up is buying a business. So if you're ready to do that, we'll help you out. We've got one on angel investing, digital marketing. Uh, Chris is back with some video and geo imaging information. And then we start the great marketing turnaround series, which is the three session series. Uh, it's fantastic and full of information. So please go to our website, maricopa-sbc.com. You can do slash events to sign up for those programs. All right, and did any questions pop up? Did I see something? Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, we get you out of here a little bit early. I hope you took some amazing information from Chris. Uh, I know there was a lot. This webinar will be recorded and put on our website so you can review it at any time and share with anyone you think might find it valuable. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you on a Zoom counseling meeting soon. Thank you.